old Dixie here. Today I want to do another silly questions video. About once a year or so I'll post on social media platforms asking people to share any questions that they have that maybe they've been a little embarrassed to ask. Many of the questions that I got in response this year I've already answered in previous videos so I'll put links to those videos in the video description. So if you don't see your question answered here then it might be in those. So the first question is when pooping do you take off your shorts and what's the best way to poop? I'm always a tad paranoid dropping a log and it landing in my shorts. I think that there is a legit concern here for real. It could happen. I've never crapped in my shorts like while I'm trying to crap in a hole, but I have managed to get it on my shoelaces somehow. So you could absolutely remove your britches if you feel like your aim isn't that great. There are multiple techniques that you can use like sitting on a log and hanging your booty off the edge or holding on to a tree and leaning back to try to prevent making a mess on yourself. But if you just Google techniques for pooping in the woods or how to poop in the woods, I'm sure that you'll come up with all sorts of ways and you can find one that's comfortable for you. But all in all, in the end, practice makes perfect. Next question is, do you think somebody with a severe peanut allergy would be able to backpack a major trail? Do you think there is peanut butter residue everywhere because of the insane amount of traffic? I definitely think that backpackers tend to carry peanut butter, especially people who are just starting out a long trail and aren't absolutely sick of it. So yes, there could be some peanut butter residue. I would say the best bet is to avoid common areas like shelters, picnic tables, etc. But I certainly think that there's got to be somebody out there who has a severe peanut allergy that is a triple crowner or has at least through hiked one of the big three trails, AT, PCT, CDT. But I would definitely carry an EpiPen with you just in case, regardless if you have any kind of severe allergy that could cause death. I have watched many vlogs of the AT and PCT and noticed many times that people who use a Garmin message device also wear a watch. The Garmin device or even your phone are the most accurate time devices you could need in almost any case. I smile when seeing someone trying to look at their watch at the same time their Garmin shows in the video showing the time. So aside from watches that are also fitness trackers, why wear a watch if you also carry a Garmin? So I assume that this person is probably talking about something like the inReach that does display time. But one example of where somebody might want to also carry a watch is if they want an alarm to wake up in the morning, but they want to keep their cell phone turned off to conserve battery. This is just one instance, there may be others, and sometimes people just like what is comfortable to them. So if in normal life they wear a watch because it's more convenient to just do that rather than pulling a cell phone out of their pocket and checking their time, or it's a fashion statement or whatever, there could be multiple reasons. What is the risk of stumbling across a yellow jacket nest and being stung? In all of my through hikes, I have been stung, I believe twice. I didn't see for sure what it was either time, but it definitely hurt bad enough that I feel like it could have been a yellow jacket or some kind of wasp. Now I understand with being outside, it seems like, okay, there's this big risk to be stung all the time. And I mean, I guess technically there is, but it's just not something that probably happens as much as you think it might. But of course, if you're severely allergic, then I would recommend having an EpiPen with you just in case. If people are already at a marked campsite, is it safe to assume that you can join them? So some places require a permit or reservations for particular marked campsites. It really depends on where you're going backpacking. But if you have a reservation for that site for that night and somebody else is already there, then obviously they allow multiple hikers to book that campsite. So absolutely, you have every right to be there. If it is in an area where it's kind of like a first come, first serve thing, then you have every right to be there just like the other person anyway. Now, by etiquette standards, I prefer to ask the person who's already there if it's a smaller site, like, hey, do you mind if I join and pitch my tent here next to you? Most of the time, hikers are nice folks who are gonna say, yeah, come on, I've only had one instance where a fella said, you know, I'd actually prefer to just 
be alone here with my son. We don't get to spend a lot of one-on-one -on -one time together. And we came out on this trip to do that. And I said, sure, no problem. And moved along because I knew there was a campsite about a mile down the trail. But if you're gonna ask, be prepared to take whatever answer they give. But the bottom line is if it's an open place, public land and there are campsites, then of course you're welcome to use them. The next question is about undergarments or underclothes. Can they be cotton or should they be non-cotton, especially on long hikes? So for backpacking with cotton, it's a general rule of thumb that cotton kills, that you should not wear cotton while backpacking. This is especially true in colder months because cotton is known to hold in moisture. And if it's cold out, then you're hiking and sweating, then you stop and now you've got this cold damp clothing on you in cold temperatures that can lead to hypothermia which is never good and can lead to death in warmer temperatures it can still be problematic but typically in another way if you've got a garment holding in moisture then you've got hotter temperatures it can lead to chafing because things don't dry out quickly so it's best to backpack with synthetic clothing because it does dry out much more quickly than cotton. So specifically with undergarments for active hiking or backpacking, I would say don't go with cotton. With that said, I have worn cotton on a backpacking trip, but I've worn it while I'm asleep. And this was in the hotter months where I just really wanted something that was light and breathable. So if you really miss having cotton undergarments, then I would say one application would be while you're camping at night, you're gonna be sleeping, not walking around and sweating. Another application where you could wear cotton might be if you're backpacking in a hot, dry desert because everything's gonna dry out quickly there. The next commenter says, this is not a silly question, but it's personal. Has anyone had experience with backpacking after a mastectomy? Because of my mom dying so young from breast cancer, it has been recommended that I have one at a young age. I'm so worried that the procedure may make it painful or at least extremely uncomfortable to wear a backpack because of where the straps lay or rub across the area. Backpacking is my heart and soul and I refuse to give it up. So I don't have personal experience with this myself, but I noticed because this is such an awesome community, people are willing to chime in and help out, that there were some commenters who said they had either a friend or themselves been through that procedure and they were able to backpack again. There was an OR nurse that said, due to drains and scarring that need to mature, that it could definitely be tender if you try to start backpacking too soon. She said that you should expect to take some time off, maybe even up to a year to let it really heal and um, to where it might be comfortable again. She said you also might experience some menopausal like symptoms like vaginal dryness and that you'd rather probably deal with those things at home, getting used to changes rather than being out in the middle of trail when some of these things start to kick in. But she recommended talking to your doctor and asking this specific question and what you might expect as far as a healing time before you can get out there and backpack again. And somebody else mentioned that if the healing process is taking longer than you thought it would, or maybe there are just some permanent differences after your surgery, that you could look into talking to somebody who makes backpacks like by individual order and you could have some things customized so maybe the straps and pressure points are hitting other areas that aren't uncomfortable so if anybody else out there wants to add to this if you've had this done and continued backpacking and you'd like to share your experience please do so in the comments the next question is when you camp with other people do you put your tent right next to other people's tents or do you give yourself some distance to avoid listening to snoring at night? So I kind of approach this like I would walking into a movie theater. You know, people have this natural tendency to just disperse. They don't walk in and sit right next to the only person in the theater, typically, unless you know them. So I just think that it's best to try to give everybody as much space as possible for everyone involved. The next question is, have you ever run up on people doing it or bumping uglies on trail? Surprisingly, not on trail, but actually when I was 
doing the Camino, I was staying in an old monastery and it was a very open public room with a bunch of beds in it and no privacy. And these two people decided to just um, be exhibitionists, I guess, and, and do the dirty right there in front of everybody, given it was like 11 o'clock at night. But a lot of folks were still awake and they didn't seem like they were worried about being quiet at all. So I actually walked over there and let them know that I really didn't think that that was super cool to do, especially in this room with people that didn't want to be a part of that and children. They didn't speak English, but I still think they understood I was fussing them out because ain't nobody want to be hearing all that. Hey, this ain't no time for humping. Get down. It's probably your mama. Next, somebody asks, I would love to know how you keep your nether regions clean. When I went on a 10 day trip, I felt like no matter what I did, it still smelled so bad down there. So I'm just gonna be straight up. It's not gonna smell like roses while you're backpacking. Sometimes you just have to embrace the stink, but I mean, there are certainly things that you can do to try to be hygienic and not have any like actual health issues. So when I go number two, I use baby wipes to clean up just to try to get it as clean as possible. And I typically run a baby wipe over all of the essential parts, if you will, anyway, once a day or so. Also to help prevent chafing, sometimes I use baby powder that's got cornstarch, not talc. Um, in my underwear, I'll just sprinkle a little down there and sometimes even in my armpits to help freshen up. I think using a bidet would be even better for going to the bathroom and then even getting some sort of feminine cleaner for down there, some maybe soap and water. Um, you don't want anything to cause issues, but just doing the best you can with a daily cleanse, at least you'll know you're keeping things at bay, any issues. Um, but yeah, you're just not gonna smell fresh on trail. Do you or anyone else notice a difference in your glutes after a few weeks on trail versus not hiking for a while? Basically, is hiking a good way to grow your glutes? I definitely notice after backpacking for a few weeks that my legs get stronger. So with strength, you've got to think there's going to be some growth. And I've never really done a whole lot of measurements of my body on a through hike or before and after, but I have measured my calves and they did grow after a six month through hike. Uh, I don't know how much difference you'd see just after a few weeks, but with the process of carrying a heavy pack, up and down mountains, you are getting a good workout in your legs for sure. I think what a lot of hikers struggle with is getting enough protein on trail. So specifically, if you're using backpacking to try to grow your glutes or any muscles for that matter, I think you should focus on making sure you're getting enough protein in your diet. And then also maybe at the end of the day, mixing up some protein powder to feed your muscles. But on a side note, after 10,000 or more miles of backpacking, I still have cellulite. So I'm pretty sure that that's just gonna be there forever. How do you know or find out what size pack you need? The best route, in my opinion, for figuring out what size pack you need is getting all of your other pieces of gear, taking them to an outdoors gear store and trying to fit that stuff in different size packs. Now you don't typically need a hundred liter pack, for example, to do something like the Appalachian Trail or, you know, a shorter trip. Those are really, if you're going out on like a big expedition for say over a week or so. Most outdoor stores are gonna be fine with you bringing in your gear and trying to fit it into one of their packs because you're probably not the first person who's ever done that. But if you're in the situation where you really wanna get the pack first and start using it, before you buy all of your other stuff, then I would suggest buying from REI because if you have a situation where the pack ends up not working out for you, whether it's used or unused, if you're a member with REI, then you have up to a year to return it. How do you deal with toilet paper? Bury it, burn it. So you definitely don't want to burn any trash on the trail, including 
toilet paper. That's just against leave no trace principles. The best route always is to pack out what you pack in. But there are some areas that you may go backpacking that allow you to bury it. Others are definitely against that. For example, out west, like the Pacific Crest Trail. They get pretty much no rainfall, or at least not near as much as we get here on the east coast. So it's not going to be broken down as well in the soil in the desert because it's basically just sand. So they always have the rule of packing out toilet paper on the Pacific Crest Trail. So really it just depends on where you're going to be backpacking and what their area specific rules are. So just make sure you check that out before you go. But of course the best practice is to always pack it out. And for packing it out, it can easily be stored in a Ziploc bag. How about toothpaste waste? I've seen a few different vlogs now where hikers are walking on the AT brushing their teeth. Where are they spitting that out so as not to attract critters or because it's on trail and not at camp, is it okay? This is one of those things that I've always just tried to do my best with. You should of course avoid spitting toothpaste spit around campsites, around the trail, and at water sources. And then also as far as what toothpaste to use, Try to avoid anything that has like little scrubbers or beads in it. But I've heard it said that the proper way to do this is to walk away from everything kind of out in the middle of nothing and you just try to spit and spew it as much as possible. So it's almost like if you're broadcasting your spit in a mist that it's like um, dilution is the solution to pollution. You know, you've kind of spread it as thinly as possible to not have just one big wad in one spot. But I just feel like that kind of makes a mess and then you're affecting more of an area, even if it's just a smaller amount. So what I do is I just dig a little hole, spit in the hole and then cover it up. All right, y'all, well, that is all I have for you today in the way of silly questions, but remember, I'm just one person with my own little limited experience. So if y'all have other answers to these questions or some tips or tricks, feel free to throw that in the comments so that we can all learn from one another. And also if you have any silly questions that you'd like to see in a future silly questions video, then get that in the comments too. Thank y'all so much for watching. And if you found this video useful, don't forget to share it with a friend and we will see y'all next time.